Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another edition of ACC Baseball, etc. Presented as always by Pitch Logic, the system used by players, coaches, scouts, and instructors at all levels of play from youth leagues to the big leagues. The easy to use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics, all the features used at the highest level. You can go to pitchlogic.com for more information. Uh, let's get intros out of the way. I'm Darren Vaught here, as usual, on ACC Baseball, etc. No gravy this week. He is tied up doing, you know, in addition to talking college baseball uh, with us on a weekly basis, he does get called upon to talk Major League Baseball, and they've got opening day coming up, so he's on assignment for that. So we have the great Aaron Fitt and the great Pat James making his ACC Baseball, etc. debut. Patty Wack. What's going on? Happy to be here. Uh, I'm happy to have you. I know Fit is as well. We we between the three of us saw a lot of ACC baseball over the weekend, so it's kind of why I wanted to, to do the collective panel here. Um, we all got eyes on a, a a different number of things between wild finishes to uh, a big sweep for North Carolina. So I, I figured just one by one, we're gonna we're gonna make our way down down through that. Um, so let's start, let's start with, I offered up to gravy last week, this King of the ring concept that we had going in the ACC. It was, you know, Duke toppling number one wake forest in week one of the ACC slate. And then Clemson gets Duke. So Clemson's got, you guys know I was at Monday night raw when it was in Raleigh last week. So Clemson, going into the weekend, held the championship belt, and they were set to defend against the red-hot Florida State Seminoles. I thought maybe there was going to be a pretty good chance that FSU took the belt from them this weekend. Uh, it did not happen that way, and it was more like Clemson asserting their dominance in, in the ACC. Um, Fit, you were there for a lot of that, including wild finishes. Just like takeaways, general takeaways from, yeah. from what you saw. Boy, Darren, it was wild. That is the right word for it. Um, my goodness. I mean, you know, first of all, two really good clubs. I mean, you know, we, we thought Florida State was was a legit contender, even though, you know, their schedule was light. We, we took some heeks. We, we were late bringing them into the rankings because their schedule was light. Uh, this was their first real big test, you know, on a weekend series. And I mean, when it came to their their starting pitching and their lineup, I mean, those are Omaha caliber units. I mean, that that's a really good rotation. Um, and you know, I mean, Jamie Arnold was awesome <laughs> on on the middle game of that series. It was seven innings, and it looked like I mean, it, to, to me, it looked like Chris Sale. You know, at Florida Gulf Coast. I remember seeing Chris Sale up close. And it's that kind of slot and explosive fastball, ninety three, ninety six. He held it and slider, and uh, and you know, they're up eight to one in the ninth inning and Arnold's out of the game at that point. And Clemson just strung together at bats and got a couple of big home runs. Um, Jacob Hinderleiter and, and Blake Wright, who's hotter than the surface of the sun hit the grand slam to tie it up. And then they, uh, and then they, they, you know, they won again on, uh, or they, they got another hit from Hinderleiter later in the inning, you know, to, to cap the score. And they basically had to make three separate rallies. That was the thing that struck me about that is because, you know, you get a couple walks and a three run homer and it's like, Oh, that's great. Now it's, only eight to four. You're still down four runs, but the bases are empty. And it feels like it's a chance for the visiting team to kind of regroup. And all right, let's see, we can find some strikes. There's, you know, less pressure on us now. There's nobody on base. And then they, they mount another rally, string them up, some more at-bats together. And then here's another home run. And once again, bases are now empty, but it's a tie game. But, you know, again, bases are empty. You got to start again. And they did. They got two more base runners and another hit. I mean, it's just like that was incredible to me. And, and certainly Clemson's offensive tenacity really stood out. Um, and then they showed it again the next day, you know, and, and, and um, once again, it was a lot of free bases. The inning before the sixth inning, when they were down 11 to two in the bottom of the sixth, uh, Clemson just strung together. I think it was five straight hard singles. That was really the key to that rally. It was seven singles in the inning, just, you know, line drive to line drive, boom, 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 boom. There wasn't a lot of free bases. And then, you know, in the seventh, five walks, force in two runs, and then you get another grand slam from Blake Wright to go ahead uh, and take the lead, and, and they wind up winning 14 to 12. And the, the take, takeaways here for me are, A, 
Clemson's offense is is scary because they're so disciplined. They have power all the way through, just like Florida State in that respect. Um, and B, Clemson has the it factor. You know, I mean, it's yeah, they're so resilient. They're so tough. They've proven that down the stretch last year. Um, what are they, 40? eight and seven or something since they were two and eight in the ACC, you know, yeah. last year where they started that series against Florida state. I and mean, they've been, they've been awesome. They've been tested. Those are, those are valuable qualities, but C as good as Florida state is in the rotation and in the lineup. Uh, the bullpen is a hot mess and there's just a crisis of confidence there and guys that just felt like they weren't ready for the moment. And, you know, they learn from that. It's better to get punched in the face in March than it is in, in June. Um, but they got a lot to figure out there, you know, and, and they'll, they'll get after it. But that's definitely a concern. It was ugly. It was hard to watch. Yeah, I I wonder, too, just based on on your evaluation of such things. Right. I mean, like Wake Forest has a bullpen that's been a work in progress. Um, Virginia has a pitching staff that's been a work in progress. They are both relatively highly ranked still and are are succeeding despite that to some degree does it, does the does the panic button with Florida State's bullpen reach the urgency or exceed the urgency like what is it similar type of urgency to, to yeah. those two or, or any other team really because right I think aside from Duke everybody's kind of like well you know man our bullpen who knows and and even Duke I mean we were worried about them overusing Charlie Bielinson and we'll, we'll get to this, I guess, but you know, Charlie's been gotten to now twice in the last two weeks. Um, they've asked a lot of them and, you know, Fran O'Shell is, is not something, you know, he's, he, he's not the dominant force that he was last year. It sounds like Talon's pitching better, but um, even, even Duke's bullpen now has shown some cracks and it, it does feel like everywhere you go. I think North Carolina right, right now might have the best bullpen of all, all these teams. And Pat, we can talk to that, but, but yes, I mean, absolutely. I'm mashing the panic button on that Florida state bullpen, like right now. And that's not saying there's not time to fix it, but I mean, like if you don't mash the panic button after blowing leads of eight to one in the ninth inning and then 11 to two in the sixth inning, when do you mash it? I mean, you know, it's yeah. just, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad right now. Yeah. And to piggyback off of that, I mean, again, I'll get to Duke NC state. Um, but that was a, a Bielinson coming in for the eighth and ninth of a game. He gets a clean eighth and, you know, there's, there's a, a fight or forgive me. He gives up a solo shot in the eighth to Garrett Pennington and it makes it a five run game. He entered and took the ball in the eighth inning with a six run lead on yeah. Saturday. That is. Um, so it was, they were up five, eight to three was the score going into the bottom of the ninth against NC state. And he's the one who lost it. He gave up three home runs in the outing, two to Garrett Pennington, the Wichita State transfer, first baseman uh, of NC State, um, on, on a, another just wild finish. But Pat, let's talk. Let's talk Carolina. You saw in it in fit saw uh, I guess one game of the series between Georgia Tech and UNC. I had actually considered making my way over to the Bosch, but. Um, was tied up with with a my game calling responsibilities in Raleigh, and I can't be upset that I didn't. I can't be upset that I went for the Saturday game now with the way that that thing turned out. But um, this was a, a a solid series sweep for the Tar Heels in my estimation. Look, I, I I told Danny off the air last week I was fully preparing to come on to this show today if Georgia Tech got two of three from North Carolina and stump for them as I think this is a regional team and like they're, they're feisty in ways that I think that's, that's clearly still possible. Um, but it was kind of a statement when they swept NC state and they got the counter to that with, with the heels taking all three from the yellow jackets. I, I think Pat, we know they can hit. The question will continue to be Folger Boaz is their Friday guy, freshman. DeCaro is the Saturday guy, freshman, even young for a freshman. It's working to this point, plus the bullpen that, that Aaron alluded to. Um, I, what's your observation of, of how and, and why that's working? Because they fascinate me in that there's the freshman wall, especially for starting pitchers. They hit it. They're going to be battling that with the conflicting idea that freshmen always get better as the season goes on 
right? Because at some point you're, you're, what do they say? Quote, no longer a freshman. So it's going to be like, which of those two things prevail for the Tar Heels as we get into April, into the beginning of May? Um, what, what did you observe over the weekend? Yeah. I mean, I think the big thing is, is with both of those freshmen and really this freshman class as a whole, um, that it is easy just to start off with the fact that like just the maturity aspect with this group, I think is really high. And I know uh, Aaron was there when Folger did his post game on Friday. I think just a really mature approach from him. And I think, you know, obviously the big question with them, as you kind of read, is, is when you're relying on two freshmen to the degree which with which they are, is uh, just how those innings stack up over the course of the season and kind of will they be able to maintain that physically? Um, I think with both of them in particular, um, I think that they are, you know, very well built. Um, and very physical in general, and that they'll be able to sustain that. But you are talking about two guys there in Folger, who was, you know, a multi-sport athlete his entire, um, just really started, you know, doing baseball full-time when he got this, uh, this fall. Like, how does that kind of stack up? And then in the case of DeCaro, um, again, you're looking at a kid, I mean, and again, a kid, like that's the key word there. I mean, he's 17 years old, <laughs> um, doesn't turn 18 for, I think three or four more weeks. And I think that that's kind of the most impressive part about that is, you know, he started the year, you know, preseason was a little shaky. The command was when he came back um, from winter break. Um, but ever since the season started, I mean, he's kind of gone to just a whole nother gear. Um, the stuff, I mean, it's so impressive. It's true for true pitches. Um, fastball is usually 92, 93, again, 94. And like he maintains that velocity um, throughout the most impressive part is that you know it never dips um you saw this weekend kind of that command you know come back again i think he walked five in that game on saturday but not a lot of hard contact against you know again a georgia tech lineup that has been pretty impressive thus far and even coach forbes mentioned on friday you know it's not just a, a powerful lineup it's also i think a little bit more disciplined as well um you're seeing a little bit more approach from them in some ways than maybe in past um, so I thought that was really impressive from him, but I think again, it really does kind of come back to the bullpen. I mean, form, and then I can't you know, sit here and also talk about you know Shea Sprague um, has really kind of emerged as a key linchpin, I think, for this staff. Um, and we're talking about a guy who a two year in his two year career at Elon was um, an extremely impressive and led the nation. It was in the, among the nation's leaders in ERAs both of his two seasons there. Also among the nation's like you know walks allowed per nine innings leaders and that command is i think really important for him you know he came in the preseason um he was shut down this fall um he pitched like his last outing was like mid-september and he didn't throw again until january rolled around um and in his elon career he never was shut down in either of his two seasons there and so he we actually talked to him yesterday after his sunday start where he went into the ninth inning for the first time in his career um, and he was saying that, you know, when he came back in the preseason, you know, trying to get that feel, that change up bat back. I mean, and that's his pitch. I mean, he throws it, I believe, 48 percent of the time more than his fastball, which is, you know, kind of unheard of, especially in these day and ages, I feel like. Um, but, you know, getting that feel back really took a long time for him. And you could see, I mean, he got pounded pretty good uh, by, again, a pretty good UNC lineup, but still pounded pretty good there in the preseason. But he's bounced back and looked really sharp these last couple of weeks. What about in the lineup? I mean, again, I, I think we expected they would hit. That is has come to fruition. Well, a couple of home runs for Vance Honeycutt. I'm yet to lay eyes on them, Pat. So just for me, as as someone who's who's uh, typically around that program a, a fair amount and just hasn't gotten that way so far this season, um, the the health of guys like Osuna and Honeycutt, those don't that doesn't seem to be an issue at this point. I mean, is it kind of the way we expected it to be where, you know, they've got, they've got more lineup guys than they have spots. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of depth. I mean, you even look this past weekend. I mean, Jackson Vanderbreak's coming off the bench right now. We're talking about a guy who was, I think second team all ACC last year. Um, and part of that's just because Gavin Gallagher has stepped up and looked tremendous. I mean, Aaron got him there on Friday. I mean, he's kind of emerged and taking in uh, that leadoff spot over these last two weeks. Um, and he's really on a heater, um, really quiet approach. has been just a super impressive freshman coming in. And in terms of health, I mean, obviously, I think the big guy is Alberto Asuna. Um, you know, 
last year gets that handmade injury, you know, about two weeks before the season. And he, even though he hit 11 home runs last season, you could still see that that was kind of hampering him. A lot of those homers, if you go back and look, were against what you might determine as a uh, lesser pitching staffs. Yeah. It was a lot and, in the midweeks. He even had a lot, like, maybe two or three multi home run games in the midweeks last year. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so like, you know, when he got some of that kind of, you know, more high octane velo, you could tell he was having trouble catching up to it. And this year, I mean, it, it's been, I mean, it's been super impressive. I mean, the power's there, it's back. He's hitting for average. He's also not striking out as much. I think the, the approach has looked a lot better as well. I mean, and even, you know, there was a, moment there on Friday where he hits a double down the left field line, um, you know, hard hit ground ball down the left side. It was 98 miles per hour exit velo. I think I told the fit. I was like, that might be one of the softest hit hits that he's had this season, 98 miles per hour. I mean, that's just, I mean, he's just smoking the ball. Yeah. And I think, you know, and again, like he's, you know, hitting there six, five, six, seven spot in the order. I mean, they've been he's around in parks Harbor. I mean, Parks Harbor hits two home runs. Parks Harbor hit one of the more unbelievable home runs I've seen, I've seen at Boschmer Stadium on Saturday, where he got a cutter in the upper left quadrant of the zone. And it didn't really cut a whole lot, but he somehow hit it like almost under the hockey stadium field there in right center. Like, I have no idea how he hit it out. I asked him post game how he hit it out. He said, I actually have no idea either. Um, but I mean, again, I mean, we're talking about a guy who, you know, proven power production and run driving in production at Georgia on um, the last, then he, and he hit seventh in the lineup this weekend. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to flip it to you guys again, because I was at Duke, NC State. I had the calls on Friday and, and Sunday. Um, I, I can give general impressions. I, I think Duke has experienced a couple of weird weekends in a row now, um, where for most of the series, they appear to be, the superior team and they just don't come away with, with more wins than, than the opposite side. I mean, J Jonathan Santucci pitched no hit baseball on Friday as, as their ACE. And, and I mean, you know, we, 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 we all know the stuff is, is the stuff it's fastball slider and he dares you to hit it. And he was, um, a little strugglesome with his command, right? A guy who does not walk a lot of batters gave seven free passes despite not surrendering a hit. They just they did they did not hit him well at all. And I, to be honest, Ryan Higgins was the same way the next day. And that's a guy that I had not seen throw this year. And and I talked to Chris Pollard before yesterday's game and was like, man, is he improved. I mean, he's he's ticked up the fastball by by two or three miles per hour consistently bumped 95 a couple of times. Um, and even Elliot Avent told me he was just like, man, he was he was filthy. He was dealing. He thought Higgins was was better than Santucci against them this weekend. And he was just like, man, we we could not hit him. That was a scenario, a rare scenario where like you're just begging to get to the bullpen against Duke um, on a non Friday. And you know, it was two days in a row at that point that we got seven innings in or so. And it was like, man, the Wolfpack cannot, they, they can't get hits. A anything that they had had to that point was just kind of a, a plucky bloop single or, um, you know, an in running out an infield hit and, and trying to make the best of some base runners with, with the walks that they were given. I mean, it was, it was the the great majority. NC State won both Friday and Saturday, but I would say 80% of those games, it was like, okay, Duke's dominating. And it really came down to the bullpens. And obviously that's way uncharacteristic out of Charlie Bielinson. Um, They put him in in the eighth on Saturday with that six-run lead. And, you know, it, I thought this was interesting. I, I – I consider this an anomaly with Brady Kirkpatrick, Duke's pitching coach in his second year. I, I think the world of him and his approach. And um, frankly, like I told a number of people over the weekend, like I, I just, as a pitching mind, I think he's brilliant. Yeah. There were some things that, that were question marks and we obviously didn't know everything that was going on with Santucci. Um, he like, for instance, had, and Luke Nixon is a good freshman at the bottom of the order for, NC State, but he doesn't have a hit off of a left-hander all year. And toward 
you know, you know, like the first time through the lineup on that Friday game, he had a full count against Luke Nixon. And he did this a couple of times with, with less experienced hitters toward the bottom of the order, would get to a full count. And he kept trying the slider on the inside edge and trying to just like place it. And he misses inside and walks to. Well, he gets a full count to Nixon the next time through the order. Does the exact same thing, misses inside. And it's just kind of like it had us questioning. And again, maybe the fastball command was enough of a concern that 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 takes you to you take that into account more than we were taking it into account. But it just seemed it seemed to us in the booth, we were just kind of like, I, I don't know, man. He's a freshman at the bottom of the order. He doesn't have a hit off of a left hander all season long. I think you kind of dare him with a fastball. Um so that that was interesting about sort of Santucci's outing. Um, and look, we saw it with Jimmy Loper a few seasons ago at Duke. They like to find a back end guy and ride that back end guy. So when Bielinson gets the ball, whether it's the seventh inning, whether it's the eighth inning, whenever, they envision him finishing the game. So I get it to a degree on Saturday. But you gave up two home runs to the same dude in the same relief outing. Yeah. It just seems to me at that point, it's it's I I, I almost expected them to throw in you know, Romano or um, you know Ky Kyle Johnson wasn't available uh, to pitch for them this weekend. He's throwing and is going to be available to pitch next weekend. The thought is he's going to return to a two way role for the Miami series in a couple of weeks. But um, I just I, I I was surprised they let him hang out there, especially given what had happened against Clemson the week before. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Um, and I do want to, you know, turn this around a little bit and talk about NC State just because, A, um, I, I think their offense is, is, is once again very good. I yeah. love Pennington. I mean, you know, he I saw him uh, on, on Tuesday. I was over there against Coastal. Um, and he's just a, you know, he's just a hit machine. He's just one of those veteran guys. Uh, you know, he's, he's built like a, like a tank. Um, and he drives the ball with authority and it's, it's a pretty mature approach. I mean, he went deep against coastal, like 113 miles off the bat. Um, and, and then hit another key, you know, I think game winning RBI double later in the game. Uh, and then talking to him afterwards, like he's got a presence about him. It's just like a, uh, you know. <laughs> he, he he basically just talked about how it how I, I i think the expression he used was we wanted to go out after after that you know getting swept by georgia tech we want to go out and show our nuts uh, is what he said which um <laughs> which they did you know they went out and and and, and showed their their toughness and won that game against coastal and then again a, a great bounce back week for them um he and and you know obviously a mac there the, the transfer from ecu just another super experienced guy who's having a, a great year so far these guys control the zone pretty well for power hitters obviously cozart you know more walks considerably more walks and strikeouts and, and hits for power and is, is an elite player and um and, and you stick in a brandon butterworth there who it's like he's maybe starting to get the bat going after a slow start um but he's he's really impressed me with his defense just you know, in the fall and also just against Coastal made some great plays, including a really impressive double play to end the game where he was um, lined up on the other side of the second base for the shift and he had to range kind of back to the bag to tag the step on the bag and then throw across his body to first base for a little six, three unassisted. Uh, it's a tough play, you know, so he, he's a nice piece. So I, I like their, I like their, you know, their lineup. They did a really good job and the freshmen in there. So, so sometimes and, uh, and Nixon, I mean, those are, those are really guys that have bright futures. So, uh, but, but I wanted to ask you about, you know, their pitching. I mean, obviously Sam Highfield was fantastic this weekend. Um, you know, I think that's probably his best start of the year, seven strong innings. Yeah. Um, I see that's one, lo his longest since the uh, Omaha start against Vanderbilt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It well, it was one pitch away from a career high. And I had to double take when I looked at the stat um when when it was when I when I saw it because he threw 117 pitches. The the career high for him was 118. He did it against Wake in mm. 2021 guys oh, like wow. wow just it was it was obviously it's a theme with that starting rotation with he and, and Whitaker that they've just been around right and yeah. it would be the same thing if Willitson was healthy and was the third man in their weekend rotation um but yeah Highfield looked great and 
I, man, I, I love, I, I love watching him pitch and it, you know, I think I had them a few times when he started in that 2021 season and he was very clearly crafty, right? You, you could tell it's, he's, he's not going to light up the radar. He's um, the changeup is, is kind of his put away and his, his bread and butter pitch. Um, and he's going to mix it up. He's going to hit spots on the edges. It, like it was more of that. And Elliot Avent had told us going into Friday that his start against Georgia Tech was shades of the way it used to be for Sam Highfield. Look, man, if 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 he can pitch, he doesn't have to go, you know, seven innings the way the way that he did on Friday every outing. But if he can be mostly what he had been prior to injury throughout his NC state career for them. I mean, that's a huge, yeah. huge piece. Um, I, I think Whitaker, uh... Whitaker's probably their most consistent pitcher as well. Um, and then the question mark has been with Dom Fritton and he was, right. he was really solid through the first three innings on Sunday. And then it just got away from him. Um, you know, he like when he's hitting his spots, Fritton does not get hit hard. I was looking at some of the advanced numbers, right? Like, his BABIP is 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 among the the best, as in among the lowest in the country, right? I mean, he's like eighty something percentile in BABIP, but the walk rate is is like lower tenth percentile. So it's just it's going to be a matter of simply locating for him, and I think he'll be fine. The stuff is good enough to where if if it's contacted, it's not often going to get hit hard. Um, so that I mean, I mean that, that's really kind of the that's going to be the the key for them. And, and, you know, Elliot talked with me this weekend about how the bullpen's got to get better. Some of that's going to be health. Um, Shane Van Dam had a freak thing happen on Friday. He got smoked by a line drive in batting practice Ooh. and is actually in the concussion protocol right now. So he, he threw, and I thought was a, looked a little shaky on Tuesday against coastal, but um, an unfortunate thing. I think, I mean, he's going to be okay. He's just in, concussion protocol and has got to get through that I, all indications were nothing nothing too serious but um we saw it happen from the booth and it was it was a little scary at first but um you know van dam's gonna factor in as a key piece for them um you know they like the freshman dude in on the back end and i gotta say that's incredible stuff yep. i mean it is and he's got he, you know, he 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 looks like a closer. Um, if if that makes sense, right? It's a little bit of sort of a wiry frame. He's got the forearm tattoo on his glove glove hand, and it just like looks the part. And then he's, you know, he's pumping mid upper nineties, and um, he looked good. He looked good when we saw him on Friday. I I, I think they've got a really good piece with him on the back end. I, I, yeah. Mainly for them, it's just going to be about it, – it, it's going to be condom for it and locate on Sundays, and in between the starters and Duden, are they able to bridge that gap? And and Fritton did at least, you know, three more strikes. He only walked one this weekend. We still yeah. give up hits, and it's just like – you know, that's a preseason All-American coming off a huge freshman year. Um, we were obviously really high on so we ranked him as a preseason All-American, and it's it's an 8-3-70 ERA. And so that's just a huge, huge piece that they have to figure out. And and, and I would say also in the bullpen, you know, as, as good as Duden and Van Dam, their stuff is, and, and the results have been okay, but like their walk, it's also been pretty good. But their walk rates are also high. Now that scares me a little bit. Like, you know, even Duden, he's got 10 walks and 14 innings, you know. Van Dam's got 11 walks and 13 innings. Like, that stuff can bite you a little bit. And so that's just something to keep an eye on with them. And um, I know that, you know, Clint Chrysler's working hard to try to find the answers, but it's funny. Like, you, you go around, you talk to these pitching coaches in the ACC and everywhere probably, and it's like – it's a tough environment right now to be a college pitching coach. Like, it feels like everybody, like all these poor guys are just beleaguered because offense has gone nuts in, in, in our sport. And, like, it's just, you know, it's hard to it's hard to find guys that you can that you can trust reliably. And I mean, NC State right now, they got a 6-8-3 ERA as a staff, and they're winning enough, but, like, there's a lot of work to do there. And so I, I like their team. I do like their pieces in the mound. I love the young arms, and I love the combination with the young arms and the veteran arms. But, like, they, they're, they you know, there's work to do. And so there's, there's just – going back to your original question at the top of the show, Darren, it feels like – who is the king of the hill? And right now it's Clemson for sure. They've earned it. 
but I mean, like, you know, they got to pitch better too. I mean, they were, yeah. they gave up 11 runs on Sunday, you know, they, they were down eight to one on, on Saturday in the second, you know, the, the second game of that double header. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, and, and, and I think part of them, they just, you know, Tristan Smith is now on the shelf for a couple of weeks. Sounds like a stress fracture. And I think his ankle, he's in a boot. Um, he's really kind of a, the, I guess, I guess you would say that been the best guy in their rotation so far. Um, you know, Austin Gordon still kind of working his way back, we're ramping up a little bit. Um, they, they got a great start from Ethan Darden um, as a lefty kind of spot starter in there, you know, sinker, change-up guy, lower slot. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I think, again, they've got pieces they can mix and match. I, I like their bullpen certainly better than Florida State's. Um, although, you know, their bullpen has some adventures too. I mean, it's just it's the way it is now. I mean, like if you can really pitch, it's such a separator um, because it's just hard to get outs with these tiny strike zones we're seeing everywhere and the ball's flying everywhere. And especially a place like Clemson where the wind was howling out this weekend, even in a very unusual way. I mean, Link Jarrett said it's the most offensive that Park has ever played, that he's been there. Uh, and Backage kind of said something similar that's very unusual. It's it's not easy. It's not easy right now to be a college pitcher or a college pitching coach. And so we'll see, you know, who's going to be the last man standing um, when it's all said and done. Uh, who, who's got the arms that can make it for the long haul? I think that's still TBD. Yeah. And and ultimately, maybe that's why I still think Duke, you know, as long as as long as they don't over, you know, overuse Bielinson too much, if they can find a way to keep him fresh, I still think they probably have the best staff top to bottom. Yeah. And, and it looks like, I mean, look, I, they're in search of solutions for Saturday, Sunday. Um, Andrew Healy looked really good on Sunday for them this week. Higgins, like I mentioned, looked good on Saturday. They'll get KJ back and and then it becomes sort of a, a too many pieces for the rotation. And what do you, you know, maybe you move KJ to a bullpen spot and you move him back into the field. And, and I, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what their, their thinking is for that ultimately. But I mean, Chris Pollard told me on Sunday, he said, well, you know, Hig Hig is, is looking to work his way back into the rotation. It's a guy that started games for them at the end of last year. It's kind of the expectation for him. And then Andrew Healy was freshman all American doing it. So, um, it stands to reason that if he th throws well, they're going to keep him on on Sunday duty. Um, so it'll be it it'll be interesting. And I'll say this about NC State because they got behind so badly. Th they on Saturday that is they used a couple of guys who had only thrown an inning at all this year, and. You know, they threw Carson Kelly yesterday, who had one had thrown one out all year. So they're sort of still in this. It's it's odd that we're this deep into the ACC slate, and a team is is still in this sort of experimental state with its bullpen. But I, I don't think they're alone in that, right? And Elliot yeah. told me like at at the time they were down six runs. He's like, yeah, I'm just trying to get some guys who have looked good in practice as of late and in their pens as of late some some time in in games and you know they they bided the time for the wolf pack in that case to to eventually come back in the the bottom of the ninth um so yeah no it, it's it's those are guys who could who could maybe factor in for them in a in a bigger way as the season goes on it's it's um it is a it, it becomes apparent at this point in the season. It's more and more of a luxury if you know what you have in the cupboard going into the season, right? Yeah. And I think that was that's what was so enticing and so intriguing about Duke entering this year is that we knew, right? Three All America type relievers for them: Santucci on the front end as the ace, like that. Th these are known commodities, and it, again, it's becoming very obvious that not everybody has that. And I will say that I think we should talk about Virginia Tech because they, um, you know, they're sitting pretty right now at uh, what the eighteen and four overall, I think, and and um, six straight, eight and six one. Straight in the ACC. ACC. That's the top record in the league right now. Yeah, and that's a team where at the end of the season with no certainty really on the mound, right? It was John Chef talked about in the preseason. It's like it's like that twenty one team where. They have all these, you know, really proven, experienced hit hitters, but um, no experienced starters, you know, on the mound. And right now, they're they're getting it done, guys, I and mean, they're pitching pretty darn well. Um, 
And sometimes that just happens. It's like, you know, we talk about experience a lot, but the only way you can gain experience is by running out there and getting it. And I, I know that uh, our, our guy, Mike Rooney, is really high on some of their young arms there. And Griffin Stieg and, and Brett Renfro um, have, have been awesome for him while at Parliament. I mean, those are three three guys that have ERAs in the threes who are all starters for them. That's exciting. You don't see a lot of that in college baseball in 2024. So as much as we, we talk about Virginia Tech's lineup, um, which is really good, you know, obviously there's, there's firepower and there's depth and it's a great infield, especially, um, you know, and, and get, give Henry Cook credit behind the plate. sounds like he's really um, emerged defensively and he's hitting 424, you know, with, with five homers, like he's having a good year offensively too. He's actually their leading hitter. Um, so there's, there's been a lot of things that have kind of come together for Virginia Tech early on. Uh, I need to get the eyes on those guys because it feels like they're maybe the team that's, you know, I mean, it's, and Hey, they played Notre Dame and BC, you know, two of the bottom teams in the league and then Louisville, well, who knows what to make of those guys, but they've struggled. I mean, they're, you know, so like, it's not like Virginia Tech's played the kind of schedule that Clemson or Duke have played, um, but they're taking care of business and they're doing it in all phases. And that that's definitely caught my attention. And I think with them and North Carolina, I mean, you look right now, those are the only two teams in the league who have achieved two sweeps during league play. Mm. Um, and I think especially in this year, kind of to underscore your point that you just said, with things being so unpredictable as they feel like they are across the league, to even go and just take care of, get business against these teams who you theoretically should sweep, I think is even more important in this season when there is so much you know going on. Yeah, no, and, and I talked with Chris Pollard about this a little bit before yesterday's game, just like, the the first of all i it's well documented the the uh admiration i have for him and and that staff and just sort of like the their their approach the fact that he spoke with me prior to game 3 after blowing a five run lead in the bottom of the ninth the way that the way that they did on on saturday that like to have such a level headed conversation with him prior to Sunday's game was um, striking in a way that, okay, they're not, they've had some, some tough, tough outings, some tough luck in league play in the past couple of weeks, but they're not sweating it in a way that I think a lot of teams would, you know, he said, you know, that's now two in a row for, for Charlie. We got to see it, about getting him right. I certainly worried about that. But it's a team that just continues to hit, and um, like he he seems to think that they're going to be okay, and and you know I think we all kind of share that sentiment, like they're they're going to be just fine. Um, but he and I spoke about just the 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 margins being razor thin, even more so than they were last year. Um, it, it's just anybody can beat anybody, and as part of that NC State comeback, Duke had a couple of mishandled balls in the field, right? And if if you jump on those, you're probably going to win more games than not in the ACC. You, it's going to be all about capitalizing on those mistakes. And um, you know, if you can if you can make a mistake and then erase it with a good defensive play, you're going to set yourself up to be to be better off. I mean, they're just so many so many I was having this conversation in the press box yesterday in Raleigh, um with a handful of people that were, were up there. You just look across certain games for teams closer to the top of the conference. And like, you could play this game where you change five swings across the league. And it feels like you could make a five game difference in terms of who's where in the standings. Yep. Right. Yep. I mean, it's just, just there, there are those, those sliding door moments all throughout the league so far where things happen a certain way, you know, wake starts. Oh, and six, if chase burns, isn't chase burns, right. Um, maybe a couple of swings from Duke getting series victories over Clemson and, and NC state. And then boom, they're, they're kind of the, the Kings of the ring, if you will. Um, there's just a lot of variance in, the stuff that's going on. And, and I know we, we had another sweep with Virginia over Pitt. They creep back into the top 10 and that's a team that just kind of like, look, I mean, I mentioned a panic button with the pitching staff. Like we were banging that thing pretty hard early and they're just, they're making it work. They're finding a way. Colin McKay's yep. risen into a, a, 
uh, a star role for them and has been has been really good. So I think that they're hoping that that can continue. But um, still some other question marks in there. I think they were TBA on on Sunday again this past weekend. So, um, you know, it, it's just the margins are are so thin. It's going to be so fun these next few weeks. And, and again, there's no let up. There's no let up. I was talking to Chris Pollard and it's like, oh, guess what? Virginia's next. Yeah. Here we go. We got to we got to we got to circle the wagons and get back at it. Yep, exactly. And it's going to be a wild ride. You know, I think that's that's the, the bottom line. So we've learned over three weeks. It's already been a wild ride and it's going to continue. It's just going to be a, a battle royale here, Darren. Battle royale. I love that. You know, I love that. <laughs> uh, any any parting thoughts as we leave the weekend review behind from either either of you to Aaron Fit or Pat James? Sounds like your dog might have some parting thoughts. Whose dog is that? Pat's dog? (laughs) (laughs) Always, always has parting thoughts, no matter what. He was like, hey, Wake got a weekend series victory. You guys, we didn't talk about that. (laughs) It's true. And once once again for Wake, it's it's just Burns is Burns. You're going to win every game that Burns starts because he's – Special, special, special. He Gotta might win. Huddled. He might, by the way, win ACC Pitcher of the Week like eighty percent of the time. This year. <laughs> he got he's, my vote this morning again yeah. for a, another stellar start. Um, he, just unbelievable. And you mentioned Blake Wright. I, I did want to follow up with this quickly because he got my vote, and I assume literally everyone else's this morning. Yeah. They, they granted they played five games this week. He drove in twenty-one in yeah. a week. Yeah. Okay. Th- Good season, Blake. Like it's insane. <sighs> Man. And I think he's gotten I think he's got nine homers his last ten games, including yep. you know, the yep. grand slam to tie the game Saturday and then another grand slam to go ahead on Sunday. I mean, it's it's nuts, you know. A, a guy that um has really bounced back strong after down junior year. I don't know, you, you know, backage maybe alluded to maybe some draft lightest there. He didn't say that, but that was yeah. kind of the implication. Um, and, but he's just matured, you know, and just the, the selection, the pitch selection is, is so good. I mean, it's just, uh, he's still an aggressive hitter, um, but he's done a much better job of, of picking the right pitches to attack. That's kind of what backage said was the key. And he's just a different level right now. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Even though I think almost all of the home runs last week, came with guys on base which is insane I mean, he had 21 rbis yeah. as well over the course of the week um i also say uh notre dame big series win for them as well oh and six yeah. in league play coming into it and they take two or three from miami again miami team that had won the series against north carolina the week before i mean it's like you said unpredictable at this point so yeah no i'm glad you mentioned that maybe the surprise of the weekend in the acc that that was um uh, just, although if, if you looked at the forecast and you saw Miami <laughs> going up there, maybe you wouldn't be too surprised. That, that tends to happen. <laughs> yeah. That checks out. That checks out. Um, well, fellas, uh, looking forward to another good week. I've got one in the ACC. Um, I'm actually going to do Coastal Clemson tomorrow. So headed to Doug Kingsmore Stadium, one of my favorite spots in the league. That should be exciting after a big weekend for the Tigers. I bet a pretty good, pretty good rambunctious crowd for that one. Um, otherwise, I'm off to American Athletic Conference duty this weekend. UAB and East Carolina, who dropped a couple to to UTSA, they're they're maybe a little scared in in Greenville. But um, I look no, forward should... to your report on next week's uh, AAC baseball etc. podcast. You know, that's what we would call. What is that? Is that vertical integration? Is that we yeah. can we can? <laughs> like they would it. the people of the American, I'm sure, would appreciate a, a specific uh, a specific pod. But um, no, I'll. I'll Always a good time in Greenville. Great crowds there. So it should be a lot of fun. And um, yeah, you guys enjoy wh- wherever you're going to be. I guess you're going to see Virginia this weekend, probably, right, Aaron? I think so. Yeah. As much as like, I, you know, I've seen a lot of Duke already because their schedule just <laughs> set up the way it did. It's so front loaded. Uh, but I got to see the Caps. They come to my backyard. I'm, I'm going I'm to probably go over there again. So let's nice. do it. Very good. Right on. All right, gents, appreciate the time as always. That's Aaron Fit and Pat James making his ACC Baseball Etc. debut. Uh, I'm Darren Vaught. Thanks for listening. Remember, on social media at ACCBSBETC, subscribe to the D1 Baseball YouTube page as well. And go get yourself a subscription if you don't have that yet. That seems kind of obvious, but I'll throw it out there. Um, Thanks again for listening. This has been ACC Baseball Etc. We'll catch you later.